Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well still, and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost you a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon. And folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to the second half, shall we? Today's first part of the upload is going to be, for me, very interesting, and I hope for you guys the same. Um, I really found it educational and eye-opening, so I hope you guys do as well. 1998, sightings of a Bigfoot-like hominid creature has been reported for many years in the rugged, isolated areas of Russia. As a consequence, Bigfoot has been studied by numerous Russian scientists and researchers of the paranormal. One of the leading Russian authorities on Bigfoot was Maya Baikova, who passed away in 1996, leaving behind a legacy of serious scientific inquiry into the phenomenon. Baikova graduated from Moscow Agricultural Academy in 19, 1955. For many years, she studied Bigfoot naming it a relic hominid. And she authored three books on the elusive creature, a legend for adults. He is, though he must not be, and not that frightening thing. Beginning in 1972, Baikova organized a dozen expeditions to search for traces of the animals unknown to science. None of these expeditions enjoyed the support of official bodies. After long years of study, she came to the interesting conclusions. Bigfoot's appearance, described by many eyewitness, betrays the creature's earthly origin. It has a traditional constitution that is four limbs with five fingers each, one head, one trunk. It looks like a man or a large ape. Its body is covered in fur. Bigfoot is nocturnal and moves very fast, and it possesses an unexplained defense mechanism that makes it invisible to humans. No one has ever seen a Bigfoot dwelling and nobody knows anything about the reason for the beast's migrations. The most stunning property attributed to Bigfoot is his ability to disappear and appear suddenly, as if dissolving into thin air. This unusual property has led to various sometimes fantastic hypotheses of Bigfoot's origin. Some tend to look for its tracks in other dimensions, while others connect its appearance with UFO activity. Baikova believed that there was no basis for these suspicions. However, she carefully pointed out that because we have no access to the object of our inquiry, we cannot supply an adequate scientific explanation of the whole phenomenon. We can only try to piece together Bigfoot's characteristics using the testimony of as many different witnesses as possible. Bigfoot's fur has been compared to that of a monkey. However, some Bigfootologists disagree, asserting that large apes live only in warm environments. Until recently, scientists believed that apes could only live in places where air temperature never dropped below 14 degrees Celsius and where there are no sharp temperature fluctuations. Yet it is common knowledge that Bigfoot has been encountered across the globe from red-hot deserts to areas inside the Arctic Circle.
The diversity of nature suggests a few possible explanations. There are several well-known animals that can live in conditions that are seemingly unsuitable for any kind of life. One example is the so-called snow monkey, the Macaca speciosa, found in sparsely populated regions of northern Japan. As a rule, Macaca speciosae live in the tropics, unlike the close relatives, the snow monkey, Macaca speciosa, have light, thick fur. They are larger and live in mountainous terrains, where the snow covers the ground four months of the year. The macaca find their food, grass, young leaf sprouts, leaf buds, and tree bark under the snow. Bykova and her colleagues were very interested in the particularities of the snow monkey's fur and structure of their skin, their behavior. Scientific studies, such as one concluded on the polar bear fur of Northeastern University in Boston, Mass., may offer vital clues to the Bigfoot enigma. There are several interesting points of comparison. Despite its whiteness, the fur of the polar bear is capable of converting 90% of the sun's energy it catches into warmth. Bigfoot inhabits inside the Arctic Circle have fur of the same color. Polar bears convert into warmth almost all of the ultraviolet rays and part of the visible ones and reflects light evenly throughout the whole visible spectrum, which is why it appears white to people. Experiments showed that when a portion of this fur is placed under a glass of a solar collector, the efficiency of the apparatus increases by 50% and more. Thus, peculiarities of the fur can enhance the survival of a flesh and blood creature. Despite such facts, however, some zoologists and Bigfootologists refuse to discuss the very possibility of Bigfoot living inside the Arctic Circle. Maya Bykova coined the term for the phenomenon of Bigfoot's sudden disappearance. The creatures camouflage its biofield to become invisible. This phenomenon has been noted in Bigfoot encounters in the Himalayas, although Bykova noted the creature knows no limits and can be encountered on all five continents. The Tibetan red-headed monks say that the Yeti possesses control over its will, or to be more specific, it can stop the activity of its brain, especially to become invisible. Monks themselves can do this. Indeed, it is a necessary part of their gradual perfection. The red-headed monks believe that the Bigfoot, or Yeti, is the only creature on earth that has preserved the ability to dissolve and become completely invisible to those all around. The monks say that Europeans have often sighted it, observed Bigfoot as a real object, and even followed it. Each time they were left disappointed, Bigfoot disappeared every time, right into thin air. Bykova thinks that this is the case of a psychological suggestion. It is directed not outward, but inward, at itself, as proposed by Professor Porchnev in his 1974 book about early human history. Excessive psych, nervous, or physical strain can trigger spontaneous natural auto-training that leads to lethargic state. This does not produce complete physical disappearance, but invisibility visa a visa to the observer. Per Professor Porzhnev concluded that humans have lost this and similar abilities as a result of the increasing complexity of the human psyche. Popular beliefs offer proof of this. In course of the evolution of the humans have gained much, including speech but have lost something at a certain stage of our evolution. Bigfoot, who has not attained the, com the capacity to speech, may be the creature parallel to Homo sapiens, our genetic companion, a member of the same order, but not above or below us, and by no means our ancestor. The mystery surrounding Bigfoot has led to many wild guesses expressed by people who have never seriously worked to investigate the phenomenon. 
the voices of psychics and parapsychologists are the loudest in this out of key chorus. Vykova has quite convinced the analogs of this earthly creature's properties should be sought on earth, not in wild fantasies. This, Bykova said, is the only sensible approach to the subject. Bigfoot's ability to adapt to vastly different environments and its mysterious defense mechanisms makes the creature extremely elusive, but in Bykova's assessment, the facts were amazingly simple. This creature can do everything that Homo sapiens ancestors and modern humans can do, at the proverbial stage of their evolution. These are the things humans strive to return to and which we admire when we encounter signs of our evolutionary past in gifted individuals, telepathic communication, the ability to find a lost person, extraordinary vision in situations that occur on the other side of the globe or inside the earth, and so on. Bykova stated that Bigfoot's behavior was of no less interest than its natural gifts. Eyewitness speak of encounters that had lasted only seconds, a minute at most. Bigfoot is never encountered face to face, and despite its ability to vanish in front of human eyes, Bykova feared that the species may be dying out. Humans' hunger for knowledge, accompanied by their complete loss of interest in the earth itself and its inhabitants, leaves Bigfoot with poor chances of survival, said Bykova. She apparently was not aware of the ecological defense movements in the West, which are now taking root in the East as well. But she went on to say that there are those in Russia who are impatient and tired of waiting for reliable data of the creature's real existence. They are ready to shoot the creature at the first opportunity and so put an end to this mystery once for all. Others believe that Bigfoot's corpse will somehow bring them a Nobel Prize. Bigfoot's powerful set of defense mechanisms offer them a natural advantage in the face of adversity. Some Russian eyewitnesses say that it is the ability to influence people, filling them with an unusual fear, just a short of complete para paralysis. Bykova was convinced that this stemmed from a form of ancestral memory that binds humans' nocturnal fears to notions of Bigfoot. She found proof of this assumption during the expedition she headed in 1992. It is interesting to note that during this same expedition, Bykova guide Maxim discovered a dozen footprints right to left feet, no less than 1.5 meters apart. The tracks ran down a stony slope of a hill. The stony slope descended at an angle of 30 degrees. Only the fool-hearted would attempt to go down there. The tracks ran among shaggy fir trees, which grew close together. Nights are pitch black there, especially between 3 and 4 p.m. or a.m., more so when it's raining, sometimes more footprints with well-marked toes were seen not far off, an inch longer than a size 29 boot. Encounters with animals always occur on the lake inside the Arctic Circle, where Bykova often led her expedition. During one incident at this location, which occurred at the beginning of the century, a local Sammy met the creature by the river that flows into the lake, taking pity on the Bigfoot. He left some food. Ever since that first encounter in the winter, the Sammy looked after his dependent. When the Sammy was dying, he asked his daughter to continue giving the hominid creature food. This is what Bykova called the advanced connect. They are quite rare, but two such Contacts are said to be taking place in Russia now. One is the Ark Hagnaslik region. The other is Vologda. Similar relations have been reported between Bigfoot and local people of that region, where the population density is higher than in the north. Local hunters have informed Bykova 
and her colleagues that all of the big game have left the area. This exodus has been caused by a geological prospecting and tourist routes which pass right through the remote hidden settlements and sacred places of the Sami people. Russian researcher Alexei Sitnikova and his team of researchers reported a very strange encounter that took place in 93 while on their way to Lake Tony. Their plan was to determine the optimal time to conduct an expedition to search for proof of possible habitation of the gigantic serpent in the region. There have been numerous reports about the existence of such a ser serpent in the far eastern part of Russia. The explorers had been planning to study the area for several years, but had been unable to do so because of the lack of resources and the wretched state of the Russian economy. In 1993, Stiknova and his colleagues decided that no matter what, that Lake Tony area had to be explored. Too many disturbing reports were coming from the area to be ignored. The group of explorers had barely began their trek when they encountered a creature known to the locals as Snowman. They were crossing the river on a raft, and on the other bank of the river noticed a man who was covered with reddish fur. The explorers recall that they felt no fear. The creature turned around, made a sound resembling grunts, and then disappeared into the thicket. A few seconds later, the raft had reached the shore, and Stiknova, with a colleague, chased the creature. Their fellow explorer, Sergi, guarded the raft. They did not find the creature, and came back to the river. Sergei did not find a barely visible footprint at the site where they first sighted the snowman. Siknova recalls that the creature was only three meters away when they saw it, and it was plainly visible. The weather was sunny and clear. The creature was about two meters in height. Its fur was a dark hue and not thick. Its head was somewhat triangular in shape, widening toward the base. The base was straight, but from the forehead toward the crown, the head was narrowed. The creature had small eyes, wide nostrils, and a slit in place of the mouth. The neck was not visible, and it looked as if its head was placed on wide shoulders. It possessed a powerful chest. Lake Tony is full of mysterious anomaly phenomenon. Siknova had collected many descriptions of the snowman, and has gathered statements from the local populace, including hunters who have encountered Bigfoot in the wilds. However, Russia has neither the financial means nor the will to explore the area. There had been many areas in part of Tiga concealed by human eyes for millennia. Secret settlements have been found deep in the thick woods. For centuries, reports about strange creatures and rituals have leaked from Tiga. The Russian snowman could be yet another creature hidden deep in the impenetrable forests. Veltin Spetnov is a doctor of biological science who resides in St. Petersburg, Russia. For years, Dr. Spetnov has conducted research on Bigfoot, and he has headed a number of important expeditions. Spetnov reported the results of his expeditions in the summer of 1995 in a Russian newspaper dedicated to covering controversial research. Although they themselves are on the edge of poverty, no funds were being allocated for any si significant research, and Spetnov is fearful of the future of the Russian cryptobiology. Being a true scientist and patriot, Spetnov cares for the ecological well-being of his country, yet he has noticed that science is being dreadfully neglected in today's Russia. And still the scientists carry on their work collecting data about the mysterious snowman, ties that have been severed when the Soviet Union disintegrated, are slowly being restored. Information is now coming into Petrograd as the denizens like to call St. Petersburg from the Baltic states and Central Asia. 
Some information has been exchanged with American researchers as well. The Caucasus Mountains have been cut off from research because of armed conflicts, but research in the Pamir Alti Mountains and the Urals and in the Russian Northwest go on. In the summer of 95, Dr. Spetnov and his colleagues took part in the expedition of the Center for Ecological Safety. The area of operation was the Vibro Viborsky region of the Kremleski Isthmus, a 90 mile long isthmus in Karela, northwest Russia, between the Gulf of Finland and Lake Ladaga. Dr. Spitnov was also a participant in the exploration work of Cryptobiology Society in whatever sort of Lakeski and Anlatuski regions. The area is known for the absence of human inhabitants. Dr. Spetnov has studied a number of reports of huge being stalking the area. Russian military border guards have confirmed that they have tried to capture the mysterious creature, but to no avail. One sighting of the snowman took place July 30th, 1995 at 11 p.m. Igor K., a technician from Petrograd, was walking in the forest near the Vesklavo village. He recalls suddenly becoming very disoriented. Igor, or Igor, knew the area quite well, yet he kept walking in circles. A feeling came to him that a strange dusk has descended. Finally, Igor came to a clearing in the forest. He noticed a giant silver-furred man at the distance. The three-meter-high creature made a few steps toward Igor, but then disappeared behind trees. Dr. Sepnov received this report eight and was unable to personally investigate the area until September. Sergei Turkin, another Bigfoot researcher, came along. The ground where the sighting took place was dry and covered with grass. No interesting ground traces were detected. However, some dried out trees nearby had strange type of damage to their bark. The creature with thick chiseled long nails had torn away at the bark to the height of three meters. Whatever it was, it apparently had the taste for larva of the bark-eating insect. In June, Dr. Spetnov had visited Riga, Latvia. He had, invited by his Latvian colleagues to help open a snowman expedition in the exhibit in the Museum of Nature. Also during this, Dr. Spetnov participated in planning of an expedition to find the snowman in the Pamir Alti. The Alti Mountains are a mountain system in Central Asia, Northwest China, and West Mongolia. The highest peak there is 15,000 feet. The Pamirs are a mountain system mostly in Tadzikistan. The highest Pamir peak is 25,000 feet. The scientists had worked out a scheme to lure the snowman by using the sexual hormones of female apes. A pheromone is any of the various chemical substances secreted externally by central animals that convey information to produce specific responses and other individuals, the same species. Dr. Spetnov was not able to join the expedition, but his Riga colleagues under the scientific leadership of M. Kudrastev, a biologist and criminologist, were able to explore the mount mountainous routine. There in the mountains of the Alti, the snowman approached the camp, growled and breathed heavy on three consecutive nights, attracted by the strong sexual secretions from a female ape. Each time it left its memorable footprints, the scientists had no trouble identifying them. The scientists tried to take pictures of the creature, having brought along a special camera for the job. 
but every time the creature appeared, these experienced strong and well-armed men were stricken with panic and fear. As hard as this may be to believe, Dr. Spetnov himself has reported feeling such fear on many occasions while pursuing the elusive creature. Dr. Spetnov has made many important findings about the snowman. The creature is an ecological antipode to Homo sapiens. It likes to visit those areas that have a lower anthrom, anthro load. That is why the snowman has been sighted in forbidden, closed-off places, the borderlands, nature reserves, similar places. For example, in the southern part of the Ural Mountains, the mountain system Russia extended, extending from the Arctic Ocean to the northern border of Kazakhstan, traditionally regarded as a boundary between Europe and Asia. Also, we know what happened on the Urals anyway. There have been many recent encounters with the snowman. This area was closed off for a long time because of radioactive pollution. Once the radiological toxicity had diminished and the environment was healed to some extent by nature, the snowman seems to have made his way back there. In the same process, take place in Chernobyl, it is natural to suppose that the snowman may eventually appear there as well. The conclusion is areas where snowman encounters are most frequently reported tend to offer the creature an advantage. It is interesting to note that the Russian sport industry has paid attention to the scientists' findings. The military industrial complex has perked its ears up as well. The snowman embodies progressive biological solutions for adaptation of humankind and to its habitat. What humans get from material culture, the snowman has obtained in the course of biological progress. There has been found profound research in Russia on the creature's movements. And back in 1994, the Russian military college began studying the movements of the snowman, hoping to use the creature's survival techniques in military applications. One of the most interesting encounters took place in November of 92. Antoli Dobrokko, Dobrokko, Dobrokinko, who lives in a village of the Matrov district, Moscow region, and works in the local children's sanitarium, was walking his dog near the sanitarium. Suddenly the dog bristled up and snarled angrily. He then saw a two-legged hairy monster about a hundred meters away. The creature was moving away toward the forest. The man says that he could make out rusty colored matted hair on the creature's back. From the distance, his son, Igor, an army captain, learned about the encounter. He visited the area of the sighting, accompanied by some employees from the sanitarium. Igor found some well-preserved prints of huge bare feet in the mud that were nearly 50 centimeters long and 15 centimeters wide at the broadest part. The participants treated the prints like material evidence, covering them for better preservation. Later, Igor returned his findings to the newspaper, and the newspaper arranged a thorough examination of the location of the sighting. Local dwellers were interviewed, some whom had seen signs of an unusual guest. The search party discovered the place where the creature had spent the last night, the attic of an abandoned summer cottage. Not one, but two creatures seemed to have been there. A second set of tracks evidently belonging to a female. The feet were smaller. The investigation of this case has not ended. There have been an interesting sighting in the Arkhangelsk region as well. In the autumn of 1989, Professor of Medicine Dr. N. Otolsky flew to a local taiga to gather some herbs. He was on the bank of the river when a bear cub came up to him and yelped. The professor heard the cub's mother roaring nearby. The professor had a knife with him, but felt it would be a poor defense against the angry beast. 
The doctor hastily abandoned his basket full of mushrooms and raced back to his boat. Suddenly he heard a blood-chilling scream from behind. Turning his head, the doctor saw a gorilla-like creature holding the bear in its hands. The beast was two and a half meters tall. The body was covered with thick brown hair. It was a female, and its large teeth were bared. Holding the bear by its hind legs, the creature tore the animal in two without it, any visible effort. The whole episode lasted just a few seconds. The professor told this bizarre story to two of his companions. They decided it would be wisest to forget the event and not tell anyone about it. Only after some time passed did they decide to report the story. Luckily, the eyewitnesses had a sound biological background. But, as more time passed, the professor couldn't help to begin to doubt the earthly existence of a creature he had sighted. Yet another sighting took place January 24th, 1992, in the village of Sosnino, six kilometers from the ancient Russian town of Kargopol. Two creatures covered with long, grizzled hair entered the barrack of an army unit engaged in a road construction. One was enormously tall, about two and a half meters. The other was half its size. Circumstantial evidence suggests that the larger was a female and the other was a child. The baby jumped on the shoulder soldier's night table while the mother stopped by a stove, waved its long arms, and gave serious short cries in a very low voice. Then the strangers, who encountered neither understanding nor approval, ran away and hid in the forest. During this incident, the strange creatures were sighted by a dozen people. More soldiers had been seen, had seen the creatures a short time before, in the morning, evening, and night. But they did not believe their own eyes. After the incident, some soldiers felt ill and went to consult the unit's doctor. One witness could not utter a word. His speech returned several days later. The strangers left behind some tufts of hair, a drop of coagulated blood, and large footprints. The footprints were 50 centimeters long, 15 centimeters wide, 20 centimeters deep. The snow was knee deep for humans. No record of Russian studies of Bigfoot will be complete without mentioning Mikhail Yeltsin. Back in early 1980, his underground report circulated in the USSR among researchers and anonymous of the anonymous phenomenon. Yeltsin was a journalist and the deputy science chief of the Gisser 82 expedition. This expedition has studied the snowman phenomenon since 1974, was organized by the help of Kamolska Pravada newspaper since 81. The Gisser expedition has explored the Pamir Mountains and Pravada has reported its findings. Even Moscow News Newspaper published a large article about the snowman. Snowman in the Mountains, November 15, 1981. The head of the Gesser expedition, Igor Talsed, revealed the latest information his explorers had obtained. Yet another Soviet scientist, Professor B.F. Porshnev, had produced a monogram, monograph titled The Modern State of the relic hominid issue. There were many people in the old USSR who were quite interested in the subject. Major publications such as Technica Moldavici, Moldavici and Nuka Relege, as well as men, many newspapers and magazines featured articles about the snowman. Many eyewitnesses said that near areas where the ape-like creatures were sighted, strange giant footprints, 50 to 60 centimeters, were often found. M.S. Yeltsin, in his account of the Geezer 83 expedition, mentions that other anomalies, UFOs, biocycle phenomenon, were also detected in the mountains. In 1994, my colleagues from the Yaroslav UFO group took part in the Geyser 84 ex expedition. 
he had a mandate from the Leningrad Gra Geographic Society of the United USSR in Palmer Mountains. The Yaroslav researchers met with I.F. Telzel. He summarized for them his experiences and knowledge of the snowman. In his view, the snowman is objective reality. He has studied the creature for many years. He points out that ape-like creatures study humans, just as we study them. The snowman, according to Tatzel, possesses a powerful biofield. It feeds on berries. Sometimes it attacks sheep, but only eats its liver. The snowman does not eat much relative to its massive size. As a rule, the snowman leaves no traces of its death. In some cases, people have attempted to shoot the creature. These individuals reported we died afterwards under mysterious circumstances. It is very difficult to catch a glimpse of this elusive hominid. Bigfoot hates bright lights. It is a nocturnal creature. It can hide under a stone. It sees very well at night. It is very careful. Human beings can always sense when the ape-like creature looks at them. Sometimes Bigfoot throws pebbles at humans as the way to be funny. However, should big stones be tossed, one better leave immediately. As a rule, stones tossed by a Bigfoot do not hit humans. It generally aims at other nearby targets, such as campfires or trees. No one has ever been confronted by an aggressive snowman. Professor also believes Bigfoot knows that there is to know about humans. There have been reported cases of Bigfoot helping people who are in danger and sometimes warns humans of impending dangers. In 1982, a group of tourists camped at the Bolshe Ravine were frightened away when stones began hitting their campfire. Seconds later, a landslide buried the camp but the tourists managed to escape unharmed. M.S. Yeltsin resides in Bulgaria and currently whereabouts of T.L. or I.F. Telzal are unknown. They have no funds to study Bigfoot and there are currently no geyser type expeditions to explore the mountains. Maya Bakova passed away in 96. The Petrograd research remains the most active today but their hands are tied by pauperization of the country. Okay, so really quick, I hope you guys didn't find that boring. Um, there was a lot of scientific jumbo in there, and I apologize for screwing up the Russian uh, language, but I tried. Um, what was interesting was the... Uh, Theories by Baikova, um, the biofield, the ability to disappear and reappear, um, which we've covered numerous times throughout many encounters. Um, the soldiers getting sick or the soldiers uh, having a sense of terror or being watched. These are things that our Bigfoots do as well. I, there's no difference. Um, one thing, I mean, this was very interesting to me because it pointed out a lot of different things. That, and it's Maya Baikova was, I mean, brilliant in my eyes. She really, really went deep into it and didn't consider herself an expert. So amazing as that is, I think we need more people like her around. One of the most interesting things to me was, and for those of you who have been with me for a very long time and have listened to all of my ramblings, I had always thought that the reason why Bigfoot is able to do what it can do is because it possesses or uses different parts of its brain that we no longer use. And of course, people, 
in the comments were like, nah, 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 we do use more than 10%. That's a myth. Well, to some people it is because in some scientific communities it's been studied that it's not or it is. There, we still don't know. And regardless of what anyone says, there's always someone to debate it. I myself believe that we use a portion of our brain. We are capable of using a ton more or incapable of using a ton more. Um, but they, the Sasquatch, evolved differently. They, they didn't have speech, which we have. They have the ability to instill fear, instill, you know, a sense of sickness. And quite possibly we were able to do that back in, you know, the Cro-Magnon days or, you know, caveman days. So I just, that, that to me, that article, thesis, whatever the hell you want to call it, blew my mind away. Now I've got some really kick-ass dogman encounters from that region of the country, Russian Finland, on to the next part of the upload. Werewolves of Skenya. It is like this that I have heard from two different places that there would be werewolves in Skenya or something similar in any case. The first story was told to me by a friend. It was his grandfather who lived in Talborg in the 1920s. He had been out in the stable late one evening when he had seen something he described as a werewolf. The reason he went to the stable was he had heard the horses barking and stomping, so he went out to see what was going on. Then he saw a werewolf in the stalls, but it moved away quite quickly when he entered the stable. According to my friend, he claimed this life throughout. The thing is that he was not an original, but a completely normal man who, from uh, what I understand, did not go with untruth. The other story my grandfather told me, he lived at the time in Sevlada. It took place in the 1930s. He was on his way home from his job at a peat bog. To get home faster this evening, he was bothered by a cow shed. When he had walked a bit through the pasture, he saw a dead cow lying on its side, some distance from the other cows. He said that it looked as if it had been torn apart by a wolf or similar, to the point here that there were no wolves in Skenya. Of course, he was scared and ran away. When he turned around to look around, saw that no one followed him. He saw something squatting by the dead cow. What it was, he does not know. He never told his father what he had been through as my great-grandfather would have been quite raw and easy to take to the rice, but but. I am 20 years old and have been told these stories in recent years, so there are no ghost stories I have heard as a child. I believe them, and I find them interesting. Someone else has heard something similar told from this time in southern Sweden then maybe you can reevaluate your faith. There has been a small number of reports from Sweden and Norway, a type of wild man, the Snowen or Bigfoot, reportedly inhabitants northern Scandinavia in Lapland and the Arctic regions of Norway, Sweden, and Finland. It is described as a dark, ape-like creature covered in thick, dirty, stinky hair. The face is broad, with prominent brow ridges, nose pressed flat, but the mouth that juts out from a huge jaw. The following report has been collected by John Ove Sundberg. This report is from the area north of Stockholm. There were many pine woods in that area, which sounds familiar. In the summer of 1985, a Swedish radio reporter talked about strange growls being heard in the Providence. Two elderly moose hunters described how they had been tracking something big and smelly and finally released their dogs to give chase. 
The dogs came back with their tails between their legs and were terrified, said Carl Johansson from Bullness. A couple of months before this, a woman, who remains anonymous, went out to a recreational area at Vaxna to clean the family cabin ready for the summer holiday. She suddenly heard what she described as a pretty heavy feet moving around outside. She sensed that this was not an ordinary intruder and actually hid under a bed. She never saw the creature, but when one hour passed, got up and went outside and then found giant footprints in the garden and around the house. She claims that the footprints measured 45 centimeters in length and were 30 centimeters wide. Following this, a couple of weeks later, two teenage girls were skinny dipping in a nearby pond when they suddenly heard someone or something moving about in the thick undergrowth nearby. Teasing and calling the intruder a pervert who spied on nude girls, they moved closer and closer towards the shore, planning to surprise or even catch the culprit. Instead, something right out of a nightmare suddenly rose in front of them. Tina, 15, told Jen, It resembled an ape, but it was uglier and very large. Her friend Petra, 13, 16, agreed and said that at the same time a terrible stench came from the creature, which growled at them, pounding its chest. Tina and Petra swam ashore a bit further down, ran through the woods without their clothes, and did not stop until they were home a couple of kilometers away. Petra's father did not believe their story, but admitted that something had given the girls a pretty bad scare. I thought it must have been a bear, he said on the phone. There is a bear in the area, and if this one had a cub on one side, it could have seen the girls as a potential threat. The girls themselves badly whipped by lashing branches during their hysterical run through the woods said they did not see a bear, but saw something far more frightening. It was like a monster out of a movie. It walked upright on two legs, Tina said. Even if it was ugly, it more resembled a man than an animal. Another sighting took place just south of Bolesen, Sweden. Mrs. Gustrasen and her husband not only saw the Swedish Bigfoot, but also heard it several times, and even claimed they found its droppings. It came quite close to our cabin, and would kind of howl in the moonlight with a voice that reminded us of a human with a bass very, very deep. We saw it more like a silhouette against the sky. It never came so close so we could identify it properly. Mrs. Gufferson said it was huge, powerful, and gave the impression of being primitive, but also intelligent. She also claims it was had a whistling sound, and at times they would hear what was either as an echo or another Bigfoot answering the call. When Mr. Gustafson investigated the area in the daylight, he found the classical large footprints and fresh droppings. Its droppings reminded me of human excrement, and at first I thought that's what it was, but they were left in such places a human would never go. I also found it in an area where we saw this creature. Today's next part of the upload. Eventually it started to get somewhat dark. I'm going to say the time was probably 11 p.m. I had planned to kick back and read, but it became a little too dark to do that. Sure, I could see and all, but it became a little hard on the eyes to concentrate on the letters. I probably was a little too tired also. Suddenly I heard a noise from the bush to my right. I turned to look in that direction and saw it just standing there. It was standing to my right and kind of ahead of me. I've listened to reports and they all say it was some big seven to nine foot monster of a beast. This one really wasn't that big. I would say it was six feet at the most, but it shocked me hard. In one moment, I was enjoying a nice evening by myself, and in the next moment, I felt extremely startled. It was breathing heavy, like a very tired man, but it sounded animal-like, weird and wild. It sounded like it had throat problems, or slime was in its throat, or something. I really don't know how to describe it in writing. 
I was still sitting at this point and just looking at it. I believe I was actually frozen in fear. I have never encountered anything other than a deer in the woods. The most dangerous animal we have in this area is probably a fox. The creature was frozen as well. It was standing on two legs with its arms down by its side. I can't say how many seconds we both stayed like this. Of course, it felt like forever, an eternity. I couldn't see its eyes because they were dark and kind of in the shadow of its brow or sockets. And it also had a, some hair, but its head was fixed on me. That I could tell. I was just sitting there, paying no attention to what it was doing. I didn't utter a word at it or yell. It just wasn't something I considered doing. I was afraid of making the first move. Now, you know how a cat slowly moves its paws ahead when it thinks it's safe or when it thinks its prey isn't paying attention? Well, to me, that was what it started doing. This incident ended with me throwing a handful of red glowing sticks from the fire at it. When I did that, it bolted. This area even has its own missing 411. Here's an interesting case of it as well. Last Monday, a Thai man working in Sala, Lapland, as a berry picker, was waiting for a lift back to his apartment. He called his contact, and during this conversation, he said, it's something weird is following me. It's like a dog or something. After this, despite being afraid of the weird creature, he hung up and immediately his cell phone was switched off, either because he ran out of battery or he turned it off. After this, the man disappeared without a trace. Police stated they haven't found any tracks whatsoever from the area he disappeared from, human or animal alike. Despite happening this week, police announced today that they are stopping all efforts to find the man except starting an official investigation. The man in charge of the operation first made a statement that this is a total mystery, but later stated that it is an animal attack and nothing else. Also, wanting everyone to lose their attention to the story and called back all the search parties from the area. The parties were mainly made of Finnish military and police personnel, and just a few co-workers were allowed to contribute in the search, despite knowing the man and speaking his language. Later, they were all called back to work, and for the last few days, it seems to have been strictly a military police operation. They found a berry bucket and intact clothes identified as belonging to the man at the scene, but the police quickly announced that they had been brought there by the man's co-workers, which seems a bit odd. Why not just hand them over to the officials instead of taking them deep into the forest and leaving them there? They found no trace of the man, no blood, no tracks, nothing. No one has any clue of what could have happened to the man. They, the particular area has some bears and wolves, but bears usually tend to avoid humans instead of following them and wolves hunt in packs. So, what was this weird creature he saw, and why did he hang up the phone despite being afraid of the creature? Only specks of the creature so far is a large, dog-like dark animal. There is no information whether it was bipedal or not. The Finland National Broadcast Network, WLE, owned by the Finnish state with 99.98% .98 share, has removed all stories related to the case from their website. Finnish media have been very quiet about this, except for tabloids, which is rather strange because our country is so small that even small events make it to national news. For example, just a week ago, every paper was reporting about a hippie camp with hundreds of naked hippies in the southern part of Finland, and they covered it for days. Now this could just be another animal attack, but it's a really strange one. For example, ending the phone call to a Finnish contact person who is from the area and familiar with local fauna, a heavy military presence. 
removing information from the news and ending the search in just a few days. Also, the description of the creature does not make any sense or the lack of tracks. Only logical option, opinion for a large dark creature in the area are bear and maybe a moose. And as stated before, bears don't attack people often. I personally can't remember any cases in all cases involving bear and bear has stumbled upon someone or they then left the scene very quickly. Well, there you have it, folks, tonight's second half. I hope that all of you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I truly like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps the channel growing and going. And honestly, what gives people a chance and a place to share their experiences and theories judgment-free. Just simply treat it with the respect that we all deserve. Thank you. Everyone stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, our pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.